Hi, I'm Peter Russell, and all my life I've been fascinated by science and the discoveries it's making about the world. But the one thing that science hasn't been able to explain is the very fact that we are conscious, that we each have an inner world of experience. It's easier to explain how life evolved from simple cells into human beings than it is to explain why any of us ever has a single conscious thought. And yet the very fact that we are conscious is the one thing we cannot deny. This is the great mystery of consciousness. Why do we have this capacity for inner experience? And it's not just human beings that have it. I often hear scientists say that animals aren't conscious. But is that really so? And when I see a dog lying on the floor asleep and its legs are twitching and its nose is quivering, I imagine it's dreaming. And if it's dreaming, it's having an experience. And also, why else would we bother giving our pets anesthetics when we operate if we didn't believe they were conscious? Why would we want to make them unconscious? The difference with human beings is that we know that we know. We are conscious that we are conscious. Now, one way of thinking about consciousness is to liken it to the light inside a film projector. At the heart of the projector is a source of white light and the light shines through the film and takes on the colours and forms of the film and then an image appears on the screen. Now what we're actually seeing is just shaped light but we get so engrossed in the movie, the stories, the feelings we're having, the sadness, the horror, the excitement that we forget it's all just a form that light has taken on. A similar process happens in the mind. All I ever actually experience are the images appearing in my consciousness. But it doesn't seem that way. When I see a tree, it looks as if I'm seeing the tree directly. But science tells me something completely different is happening. Light enters the eye, where it's absorbed by the retina and it triggers electrical impulses, which travel down nerve fibers to the brain. The brain then analyzes the data, and from that creates its own picture of the world. I then have the experience of seeing a tree. What I'm actually seeing is not the tree itself, but the image of the tree that appears in my mind. And this is true of everything I experience. Every sound, colour, sensation, taste, smell, memory, thought. They're all just images appearing in my mind. It's all forms that consciousness is taking on. But where does consciousness itself come from? This is the great mystery. It may be that one day we'll understand the brain so well that we know the exact physical processes that go on when we have the experience of seeing a tree. But even when we do, the question still remains of why is there consciousness in the first place? Why doesn't all this brain activity go on in the dark? This is what philosophers call the hard problem of consciousness. How is it that something as unconscious as the matter of the brain can ever give rise to something as immaterial as an experience? I think it's not actually a hard problem so much as an impossible problem. Impossible within the current paradigm. In some ways we're like the medieval astronomers who were locked into the view that the Earth was the centre of the universe, with the sun, moon and stars orbiting around it. But there was a problem with this view. The planets did not move smoothly through the sky. They wandered back and forth amongst the other stars. The medieval astronomers tried to explain the peculiar movement of the planets with increasingly complex systems of orbits. But nothing seemed to work. When Copernicus came along and suggested the Earth might be spinning around the Sun, no one took him seriously. And when Galileo found evidence to support Copernicus, the bishops refused to look through his telescope, knowing it could not be true. It was only a hundred years later when Sir Isaac Newton did the math and proved the new view was correct, that the paradigm was finally established. Today we are in a similar position regarding consciousness. 
we are locked into the view that consciousness itself is somehow created by the brain. And people have tried various ways to explain this. Some think it's to do with the processing over the brain as a whole. Some think it's to do with quantum effects inside nerve cells. But try as they may, no one has succeeded in explaining how any purely material process could ever give rise to an experience in the mind. We're rather like the medieval astronomers who never questioned their basic assumption. And what is our basic assumption today? It is that matter is not conscious. That matter is totally devoid of the capacity for experience. An alternative assumption, and one that's being taken seriously by a growing number of people, is that the capacity for experience is present to some degree in everything. Awareness itself isn't something that's created by the brain. It doesn't suddenly appear as if by magic out of nowhere once a particular arrangement of the nervous system has evolved. The capacity for experience is there all along. Now this isn't actually such a new idea. You find it's a common theme in Eastern philosophy. Many Western philosophers have explored it. But it's never been taken seriously by Western science. What happens if we do take it seriously? It turns out it doesn't really change anything in science. Mathematics is still the same. The laws of physics all hold true. Chemistry, biology, everything we've discovered there is the same. What it changes is our view of ourselves and our place in the cosmos. It puts consciousness right back at the centre of things. In this view, consciousness is not limited to creatures with nervous systems. Even a simple bacterium has a faint glimmer of awareness. Nothing like the rich experience we know, nothing like a thought or a feeling, perhaps just the faintest sense of warmth or light. If numbers could be put to it, maybe a billionth of human consciousness, but not nothing at all. As life became more complex, also its experience of the world became more complex. When it developed sensory systems, it was able to take in more information from the world. And then later, as it developed nervous systems, it was able to process that information and get a better picture of the world around. So the image that appeared in consciousness got richer and more detailed. And then with human beings, evolution took another step forward. Because we not only see the world and hear the world in all its incredible detail, we can also think about our experience. We can reflect upon it. And we can also then begin to reflect upon ourselves and the fact that we are experiencing. And we notice that we are conscious. We become conscious of consciousness itself. And this is the next great step that we've made. We have made the step into self-awareness. With self-awareness came a sense of a self, of an I that is aware. But what exactly is the self, this feeling of I that we all know so well? This is the second great mystery of consciousness. We use the word I so much, you'd think we knew what we meant by it. But as soon as you try to define this thing we call I, you run into problems. Who am I? How do I define myself? Peter Russell? That's just my name. A writer? That's an activity from my past. A man? I have a male body, but I can imagine myself in a female body. I might have different perceptions, feelings and values, but the I that has them would be the same. It's that same sense of I that has been there all my life. What is this I that is always there? To know what the self really is, we need to carefully observe our own consciousness. And this is the path that many spiritual seekers have explored. They've looked deep within their own minds, trying to find the essence of self. And they all come up with the same answer. There's nothing there. No thing we can call the self. This sense of a unique, separate, individual self turns out to be an illusion, albeit a very convincing illusion. This feeling we call I 
is just a feeling of being conscious. Many experience it as simply a sense of being. But because we don't normally recognize that what we are is this inner quality of being, we keep looking for some thing we can call the self. And so we dress ourselves up in all these psychological clothes, things like the roles we play in life, the way people see us, the things we do, our personality, our character. But these are all images of the self, they're not the self in its true essence. It's almost like the opposite to the emperor having no clothes. In this case, there's lots of clothes, but no emperor underneath. If we imagine ourselves to be the various ideas we have of the self, then our sense of identity is always at the mercy of events in the world. If our circumstances change, if our roles change, if the way people see us changes, then our very sense of identity can be threatened. And as a result of this, we spend a lot of time and energy trying to fend off threats to our identity, trying to bolster our self-image, buying things we don't really need, trying to be someone. On the other hand, when we discover what we really are, when we discover this sense of being that's always there underneath, there comes a sense of liberation. There's the realization that we don't need to do anything in order to be anybody. And with that, the mind relaxes. There's a sense of deep relief. Underlying everything we do in life, everything we're looking for, everything we're chasing, there's one common desire, one universal purpose, and that is we want to feel better. We want to feel more satisfied, more fulfilled, more at ease. None of us wants to be in pain or suffering. We want to avoid that if we can. We all want to feel happier, have more joy in life. What this ultimately means is that what we're really looking for is not things so much as a better state of mind, a more satisfying state of consciousness. This is the mind's bottom line. As the Dalai Lama put it, in the final analysis, the hope of every person is simply peace of mind. There's nothing wrong with this. It's completely natural. Where we go wrong is in the ways we go about finding peace of mind. Welcome to Beverly Hills. You have arrived. So we chase after wealth, possession, fashion and fame, in the hope that if we just got enough, we'd finally be happy. Now sometimes we do find what we're looking for, and we do feel happy again. But it's not a happiness which lasts. So we start looking for something else to make us feel better. Many of us spend our whole lives just looking. Yet the truth is, it isn't having the right things or experiences that makes us happy. When we examine our minds closely, we find the very opposite. When we think there's something missing, something we need in order to be happy, we create for ourselves a feeling of discontent. This I often think is the sad joke about human beings. We're so busy worrying about whether or not we're going to be at peace in the future, we never allow ourselves to be at peace in the present moment. How can we be more in the present? In itself, it's quite simple. It's just a matter of relaxing the attention and opening our awareness to what we're actually experiencing. Just noticing the actual sensations in your body, flowing of the breath, feeling in the hands, just noticing what is, as it is, without thinking about it. Our experience of the body is always in the present moment. It's our thinking about it that takes us out of the present. 
the mind's been so deeply ingrained to think about what's going on that very easily it jumps in and off again on some train of thought. When you realise that has happened, just simply relax the attention again and once more become aware of what is actually happening in the present moment. The practice itself is simple, like any other practice. It's just a matter of repeating the process again and again and gradually it gets easier and easier. The world's spiritual traditions appear on the surface to be very different. They have different views on the origin of life, or our place in the universe, or what happens to us when we die. Some believe in a supreme being, some believe in many deities, others don't talk of God at all. But they do have some common underlying themes. They all see that we get caught in attitudes and beliefs that don't serve us well, that lead us to behave in ways that are harmful to others and often not even in our own best interests. Each spiritual tradition seeks in its own way, some through prayer, meditation or devotion, to open to the inner world of the mind, the world of the spirit. They want to liberate our souls, to free our minds from self-centered attitudes and materialist attachments. They are urging us to discover who and what we really are. In one way or another, they are talking about a shift in consciousness. Consider what happens when we find ourselves stuck in a traffic jam. A traffic jam only has the power to stop the traffic. It does not inject adrenaline into your bloodstream. If you're feeling upset, it's because the voice in your head is telling you that you're going to be late, and if you're late, bad things may happen, you may miss the meeting, you may be late home. It's this that's making you upset the fear that you will not be happy sometime in the future. Western science has been remarkably successful at explaining the world around us, but it hasn't given us meaning. The world it describes is a dry, material world without any real purpose. And science has also given us an abundance of technologies which we've used to satisfy many of our needs and desires. But again, it hasn't given us values. It doesn't tell us the best way to use this incredible knowledge and power. It also hasn't really helped us develop inwardly. If anything, it's reinforced our sense of self-centeredness. We're probably more full of ourselves today than we've ever been. I think what we need today is an integration of our scientific understanding of the world with the wisdom that's held in the world's spiritual traditions. The origins of consciousness may remain a mystery, but how to awaken our consciousness how to free ourselves from misguided attitudes and values, to discover who and what we really are, that is not a mystery. That's something that's been explored by spiritual teachers from around the world, people who've gone deep within their own minds and discovered the true nature of consciousness, and from that, how to live with joy and love in their hearts. And that's what we need today. We need to rediscover that wisdom for ourselves. The next great frontier is not outer space, it's inner space. Research into the nature of consciousness itself. The one thing we all know for sure, and the one thing we've not yet explored.